Karina, I see. Would you like to do that? Or would you like me to do that? Or do you, would you like someone else to do that? I was actually just going to ask, um, I was, I, it, any of the above is fine. I was actually just going to ask if, um, Kara, were you going to share the screen? Um, I had, what did you want me to share? Or the, the PowerPoint, or would you like, would you like one of us to do that? Um, you can. Okay. Hey, Karina, before we go, can we just quickly go around and introduce ourselves? There's a couple people here that sure. I'm not sure that I know how they're connected to these. Um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Amy Constam. I serve on the board and chair this committee. Kara? I'm Kara Bradshaw, and I'm the executive assistant for the board. Just jump in, people. Lorna Fast Buffalo Horse, um, Director of Multiple Pathways to Graduation. I'm Nettie Legters. I'm a student success manager in Multiple Pathways and help lead the prep project. Donna Jordan, Executive Director at Mouse Learning Center. Jenny Stackhouse, Executive Director of the Portland Village School. Jenny Braden, Charter School. Um, Office Assistant. Tara O'Neill, Director uh, of the Program Director of the Charter Schools for PPS. I'm Erica Stavis. I am the Program Administrator for Contracted Alternative Schools. Shuka Rasvani, the Executive Director of Le Monde Immersion. Hi, I'm Sunita Sandoz. I'm the Administrator at the Emerson School. Jeff Lafayette, College Manager at Portland Community College. Nathaniel, are you there? I think we have our student representative to the board, Nathaniel Shu, with us in some way, shape, or form. Anybody else? Uh, Roseanne Powell, Board Manager. And Ma Michael Kahn, the principal at the DART schools. And I'm Max Whitehouse, the assistant principal for DART. Sorry, yeah. yes, I am here, Nathaniel, student rep for the board. Great. And I'm Joe Ferguson. I teach uh, science and career and technical ed at um, Alliance High School at Meek, and I'm a part time instructional coach. And yeah, Scott I'm Bailey, board member and member of the committee. I'm Margaret Calvert, uh, Regional Superintendent for High Schools and Multiple Pathways Graduation. All right, I think that might be everybody. And I'm Karina Wolf, the Area Senior Director for Multiple Pathways to Graduation. Is Kayla here? I'm not sure. She said she could okay. come. She was on her way home from hybrid um, and was hope hopefully gonna be on by 4.30, so she should be here soon. Okay, perfect. We'll introduce her when she comes. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and then thank you, Lorna, for sharing your screen. And then if we go to the next. Thank you. So just an overview of today, just in response to, to what the committee had asked to speak about today is an overview of our DART schools, um, um, an update, an overview of our prep project, um, um, some review of how we evaluate our contracted alternative schools annually, um, a kind of review and update on our multiple pathways cohort-wide supports, and then just celebrations. Amen to that, graduates. Yeah, and we will, I know that some uh, that board members have another commitment at six, so we will be ending at 5.50. That's our, that's our go time for, for wrapping up. So now to your question, Amy, I am, if whoever would, if we, I'm curious if we have a volunteer who would like to read it, or if you would, Director Constam, um, whatever you prefer. Nathaniel, would you like to read this? Can you see the screen? Nathaniel might be in now. 
Uh, we gather today on the stolen lands of the Multnomah, Kalapuya, Chinook, Clackamas, Cowlitz, Malala, Kathlamet, Tualatin peoples, among others. An estimated 90% of our region's original native people were killed by violence and disease. Those who survived were forcibly removed from the land they inhabited from time immemorial and now reside in one of Oregon's nine federally recognized tribes or in non-reservation native communities in the state. We share this information with humility and with respect for the land and its inhabitants past, present and future including the approximately 2,174 Native students in Portland Public Schools. And I think we would be remiss if we read this today without thinking about the conversations that are taking place in the state of Washington um, about the history of Native people forced into government schools and um, the terrible practices and extermination that took place um, in those supposedly educational settings. So with a heavy heart, we revisit that history. Thank you for that, Director Constam. Um, and I appreciate Lorna, uh, Fast Buffalo Horse, for writing that land acknowledgement. Um, so our first topic today um, is uh, to hearing about our Dan residential treatment um, schools. And so our Dan residential treatment schools are what they're called DART schools. And the students a couple of years ago and staff renamed, um, they chose for DART to mean discovering and rising together. So you will hear both if you visit DART schools. And if we go um, next slide and at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, Michael Con Principal Michael Kahn and Assistant Principal Max Whitehouse to tell us a little bit about DART. All right. Thanks, Karina. So my name is Michael Kahn. I'm the current principal, but I'm also the outgoing principal of the DART schools. And so um, I look forward to sharing with everybody currently what we're doing. But um, yeah. So just to give you a sense, our funding is slightly different than a lot of the programs in PPS. Uh, we're long-term care and treatment funded, which means that we are separate contracts um, that are funded directly through uh, ODE. And so um, every couple of years we come up and um, there's, an RF, there's an RFQ and all the things that we have to go through uh, to get our programs in there. Um, a lot of the funding is, is based on student enrollment. Um, so as our numbers go up, so does our funding. And as our numbers go down, typically, so does our funding. But um, that happens uh, every couple of years. So a um, little bit different than, than what you would get at typical schools. Uh, are the student population that we, we serve, there's a couple of, of ways students come to us. There's one through DHS placements. Um, another is through OIA placements, and then also we have direct placements at times by uh, families and sometimes by school districts, depending upon the program. Um, our hospital level of care, which is through Tram Tr uh, Trillium Family Services, typically comes through um, medical providers and uh, DHS. So, and we serve the, the mental health education partnerships we have include Trillium Family Services, which we serve Perry Center and Edwards. Uh, Morris and Child Family Services, which is our breakthrough and counterpoint programs. Uh, LifeWorks is a day treatment, which is our Nickerson program. And then our Janus Youth Program and, and our Boys and Girls Aid programs, which are served at Clinton School currently. But we'll be moving to Kenton and over the summer. So, so yeah. um, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead, Max. You're good. <laughs> I was gonna give just a little more info about each campus and the types of students we serve. Um, so Perry Edwards is a day treatment facility. We have K-12, um, we have four classrooms there and often the students are coming out of the Perry residential treatment. So it's a step down um, place, not always, but it is often step down from Perry Res. Um, Perry Res has, like Michael said, the hospital setting, um, for the secure child and patient program. They also, the older classrooms often um, support young people who for sixth through 12th grade who are struggling with anxiety, depression, often a danger to themselves or others. Um, and they, you know, the, the length of stay varies. Um, the younger kids are there a little bit longer um, and the older kids are there for just a couple weeks sometimes depending on insurance. Um, 
reasons. And then SAGE uh, is our program. It's another part of Morrison Child and Family Services. It's a residential treatment. Uh, we serve sixth through 12th graders there, uh, generally students who identify as female. Sometimes there are students who identify as non-binary um, and they are victims of federal sex trafficking. Um, the Clinton Day Treatment School serves uh, two treatment agencies, Janice Youth Program and Boys and Girls Aid, and they are different uh, group home type settings uh, that provide treatment and wraparound services for sixth through twelfth graders. Um, a lot the kids from Boys and Girls Aid are often foster kids, um, and the Amani House is the other program through Janice, um, and they serve they serve young people who are they are trying to break the cycle of sexual violence. Um, and it's a program that really supports young people um, in learning new strategies and, and supports to help them get back into their home settings. Um, oftentimes they do go back home when they finish the program. It's, it's a really great successful program that we have there sometimes with us all four years of high school. Um, and Breakthrough is a day treatment program, OYA, Oregon Youth Authority. It's a drug and alcohol uh, program. The, the students there live in Proctor Homes, part of Morrison Child and Family Services. Counterpoint day treatment is very similar to Imani House, um, and those young people live in Proctor Homes instead of a group home. I mean, it's another long-term program. And then finally, we have Nickerson, which is a day treatment school. Uh, sometimes they have as young as fourth grade. Um, and that is our one place where there sometimes are school placements uh, from uh, from the district. Uh, if if there's no other good place for them to go to get the services they need for mental health care, they go to Nickerson. Um, but most of the time, it's a it's a family placement. Um, and all of these programs, the students that go there, they are only our students because they are part of these programs. Um, we often get a lot of questions from principals and other folks saying, "I have this." This kid at my school who would really benefit from one of your DART programs, how can I get them there? And uh, we only can take them if they are actually placed into one of our treatment programs. So that's the overview. So um, thanks. Thank you both, Michael and Max. I guess I'd like, I'd just like to pause for a second and ask if there's any questions uh, for any of us or any feedback or reflections um, on, on DART. So are all or most of these programs fully subscribed and do we have more students who need and could benefit from these settings than we're able to accommodate there? Uh, currently, it's been a struggle to actually have our, our programs uh, completely full because of the challenges with, um, there's a variety of different challenges. COVID has presented so many different um, things in terms of even staffing uh, for our partners and being able to find people to, to operate that. So currently our numbers are pretty low, but they're low across the state. So it's not unique to the PPS. Um, you know, there's always a need. And I think, um, you know, in terms of school district placements, I think Nickerson is a place that PPS utilizes a lot. I would say at any given point um, within Trillium, about 35% of the students that are served uh, either at Edwards or Perry Center, probably about 35% of them are PPS students who live in the county. Um, and so that's, it's definitely an area of need, but currently our numbers are, I would say, are, are down across. The board. I would say that part of one of the impacts um, that we also see is we see the impact of health insurance, um, Health and, and Max, maybe you want to speak to this, but um, of, of students getting discharged um, quicker than sometimes we would hope. Yeah, sometimes we'll get a, we'll get notification. Um, you know, after we've had a kid for two weeks, we'll get a notification. This this child is discharging tomorrow, um, and it's often because of the insurance. Uh, you know, specifically with the residential treatment, um, inpatient is very expensive and. Um, the treatment there is is good. They get a lot of support. They participate in family treatment. Um, and on paper, according to, to the um, insurance companies, there's often, it looks like, you know, they're doing great. They're, they're stable. They can go home now. 
Um, and what we know is that um, two weeks is not long enough for somebody to stabilize. And so it's, it's helpful when insurance will pay for day treatment so they can step down and get the services, especially because we provide the education at both sites so the teachers can create some continuity for the kids in school. Yeah, it's important to know that our, our services for education really are, um, it's, it's a therapeutic setting first, right? So we're really based around the treatment needs of the students. So if, you know, our school day is a little bit different in terms of how long students are with us, because at each site, it just depends on when they may have treatment groups. And so it does make for, um, you know, some unique challenges when it comes to actually scheduling to make sure we're adhering to ODE requirements, but at the same time, uh, being good partners with our agencies to try to meet the, the various needs of the kids. So let me ask Amy's excellent question from a, a different angle, because uh, I think what I'm hearing is that the need is there, mm -hmm. um, but it's the all the funding crap that gets in the way of more, more students at need being enrolled in these programs and then uh, being enrolled in our educational program. Is, is that um, not eloquent, but uh, a yeah, right. better statement of? Yeah, um, I would on? say that the, you know, DHS and OIA um, utilize the programs quite a bit. And so that there is, there's, uh, there's space. And when we're really operating prior to COVID, I would say the majority of our, our spots were full. Um, when COVID happened, because of the variety of different challenges around processes and procedures and being uh, residential care facilities and facilities uh, that are bringing students in and out, um, it really, when we have outbreaks, which we've had uh, COVID, it, we have to look at a reduce in numbers and how do we keep students out and how we keep things safe in the facilities. So yes, um, the need is, the, the need statewide for mental health services for students is humongous. And there is a, there is a endless amounts of students who could access that. How they access that partly through their insurance piece is one way. Another way is through DHS placements and then also the OIA spots. So it's not all, a, a lot of the insurance providers, um, you know, that's really kind of the Perry Center and Trillium, but the other ones, uh, if you look at some of the other programs, it's gonna be whether or not OIA has students, whether or not DHS has students, and, um, and can, can we actually end up supporting them and keeping people safe in COVID? I mean, that's, um, that's where we've seen our numbers go down significantly is because of that. But again, that's not unique. PPS runs, we have more day and residential treatments than any other district across the state. So we have students that come from all over the state of Oregon who receive services from us. Um, and that need is high. That need is very high. And, and Michael or Max, and also Karina, I'd like to hear from both your perspectives. Um, does it, do we feel like our PPS counselors and administrators are well-connected to the DART programming so that they sort of understand the services that are available to kids when, when kids might need to make a transition? Um, do you want me to take that, Karina? Do I, I can I can start. I All think right. there's work to do. I, I think I think there's work to do. Um, and I think that DART so that some people are very familiar with DART, DART schools and programs. And there are other people in our district or places in our district where um, where that's not the case. And so and so we, um, and so we could we could certainly do a better job. Kind of circling back to to Director Bailey's question is. I think one of the things that we all know when we look at child welfare and how we take care of students and children um, is what is the opportunity, um, what is the opportunity that our state has to look at things differently so you don't have to have your kids go into care to get the mental health services they need. And I think that sometimes that is what the system, um, when the systems don't talk to each other or don't talk to each other as well as they could, um, that that's some of the outcomes. So when so when Michael and Max talk about um, OIA is a good system that we're really that we're very connected to Oregon Youth Authority or uh, Department of Human Services, Child Welfare, and Self Sufficiency. 
but child welfare um, and, and having those relationships. But I think it's this whole other piece of work around when you're parenting kids with big mental health issues and their kids are really struggling, how are we not just as a school dis- as a school district, but how are we as a larger, broader community taking care of our students that have mental health issues? And I think we have a lot of, there's a lot of room for improvement there. Yeah, yeah and I think part of the challenge with uh, PPS administration knowing is that, you know, these are not spots that PPS places students into. So a lot of times they don't know about the services because it's not something that can be accessed through your continuum of services within PPS. It's really gonna come through a different avenue through the DHS, OIA, and through the insurance. It's, um, we let the the, the schools know when a student is with us, but when we discharge in the transition, when they get ready to leave, it's probably the time when people, when they receive a student back from a DART program, where they learn a lot about it. And they they wanna know where has the student been and we tell them, and, and then we have the opportunity to explain to them what that setting looks like as they transition back into their district so that the district then can make a decision within their continuum of where they feel like is, they can best serve the student, whether that's in multiple pathways programs, if they have an IEP, what's the continuum of services placement uh, for a student. So they really get to know the programs when they have a student kind of discharging from us and going back. Um, so. Thank you. And I'll just, um, I just wanna um, take one minute to just thank both Michael and Max. Uh, Michael did just share that he's the outgoing principal and he's been there for two years and just done an amazing job. And so really, really grateful to all of the systems and work that Michael and Max have together been just a fantastic administrative team at DART. Um, So thank you both. And I also just want to say, you know, our work in DART schools is one of the things as an employee of Portland Public Schools that I'm most proud of. The fact that we have a school that serves young women that have been sexually trafficked is um, is meeting the moment. And it's uh, it's unfortunate that it's necessary, but it's 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 really wonderful that um, that that's part of our portfolio of DART schools. So there's a lot of good work um, going on in in our DART schools. So. so um, even within our multiple pathways to graduation umbrella, sometimes the DART students and the DART schools are um, least talked about. So I appreciate you, Director Constam and Director Bailey and Director DePass asking to get some information on the DART schools, because I think it's important that we keep we keep these students in, in our mind's eye as well. Absolutely, and Michael and Max, while we have you here, um, so the purpose of this committee is to really inform the board and often, um, you know, create new, uh, create a forum for to discuss potential policy changes and advocate for budget changes. So um, while while we've got you, please feel free to share anything that you think you know, needs to be fixed or could be addressed at the policy level or from a budgeting perspective, um, things that intersect with our responsibilities and and the governance realm. Yeah, I I think it's really important that, you know, PPS has made a commitment to mental health services um, and has been pretty outspoken about that on the news and the the things that we communicate to the public. And I think it's really important that, that PPS recognize that they they are responsible for the services of some of the largest uh, mental health treatment, uh, residential and day treatments in the state. And uh, really owning that piece of it, that um, our teachers are PPS teachers. Um, We work alongside some amazing staff from the agencies and and really keeping in mind that if PPS's commitment is to, to providing a continuum of mental health services, that within that is DART even though the kids in the district may not be able to access that, we still serve about 30, 30 to 35% of our students come from PPS and we return back to PPS. So how do we ensure that, that there's good communication and that um, people recognize the work that's being done and recognize the work of our agencies and acknowledging that you know, they're up against some financial burdens as well. And how do we as good uh, district partners uh, work alongside them to to help with some of those costs that that they may do because it's it's hard work 
It takes a tremendous commitment from everybody, and it takes a commitment from everybody in PPS, from every you know everybody across the board. Um, so uh, we just appreciate the opportunity to be here mm -hmm. and and share that with you. And happy to answer any questions that you have uh, going forward. Send us an email if you if you think of something later. Thank you, and I'll just put a little bug in your ear. Uh, another area where we potentially can be helpful is that we create a board advocacy agenda for uh, legislative advocacy. So mm -hmm. to the extent that you see impediments uh, at a statewide level, um, you know, elevate that to us yeah. as we build our advocacy agenda. That's great. Yeah, I think that's really important because um, we see every year we see cuts to the state budget for long-term care and treatment. And so we're, we're operating on, you know, like 75% of total cost. And every year we have to cut staff because we don't get full funding from the state. Um, so advocacy is really essential because, you know, we need, even though we have small class sizes, a class of 10 kids in DART needs a lot more support and needs a lot more staff. Um, and so, you know, having to constantly shuffle people around and, and, and cut staff because of this, our funding is being cut from the statewide level. It's really, it's really hard. It's hard on the staff. We have teachers who have been in DART um, for 30 years teaching in DART um, because they love working with the kids and they love what they do. And every year they see more and more people have to be unassigned and moved around. So it's challenging work. Um, so thank you for the advocacy. And, and has DART received SIA funding? Yeah. Student investment account? Okay, good. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, our next topic um, is a really exciting topic. Um, and that is, um, we often talk about the practices within multiple pathways to graduation and what we, how we focus and our work to be very student-centered. And so that has really culminated um, when we look at what are the best practices that we do within our cohort of schools and programs, it really culminated with us looking at data and reviewing data and um, applying for and being awarded um, a federal grant. And so now we're in year four and we have lots of information to share about that. Um, and so I'm excited to, um, to introduce Lorna um, Bass Buffalo Horse, our director of Multiple Pathways and Nettie Ledgers, our project uh, student success manager of the prep project and Joe Ferguson, one of our teachers. And then at some point, Kayla Ford, one of our students. And so, um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Lorna. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, as you can see, PREP is an acronym for Personalized, Relevant, Engaged for Post-Secondary Project. Um, the $3.9 million grant was one of just a handful that were awarded nationally, and one of even fewer that really focuses on um, alternative education students or students who've been out of school. Um, sorry, I thought Karina was motioning me. Um, no, I was so, just gonna say we were one. We were one of the only one. Got it, okay. I thought so, but I didn't wanna brag too much. Um, so some of the elements of the prep are project-based learning, um, social emotional learning with a kind of a culturally sustaining um, elements to it and um, CTE, which we know for all students is very positive intervention, but we have been braiding these three interventions in the PrEP project in unique ways that we're very proud of. So um, some of the, the research that we were kind of looking at um, before, we applied for the PrEP grant that we included in our narrative is really around push and pull factors. Um, what are the reasons that students become disengaged from school um, at risk of leaving school early before graduation and then in some cases leaving? Um, we know that push factors include um, just a lack of engaging curriculum for students, 
kind of a cultural incongruence um, for students who are minoritized in our society and may not be represented well um, in the curriculum or instructional methods, a lack of a sense of belonging. Um, we know that um, exclusionary discipline is a push factor, and we know that students behind in credits are all push factors that push kids out of school. We also know that students have um, complicated lives and sometimes their lives pull them out of school. They might need to work, they might need, they might need to parent, they might um, have social, emotional, physical or mental health issues, either them or their family, or just adverse life experiences. So the prep model of braiding those three um, strategies is really designed to re-engage students um, who have been pushed out or pulled out through that project-based learning, um, CTE, social emotional learning, really integrating those three in many cases. And so Lorna, those strategies are, we're applying those strategies across all settings? So the prep project started out um, in just three places. So um, initially we were at the two Alliance campuses and MLC. And then um, in the third year, we added Rosemary Anderson Lentz campus. We're also now in the process of adding Rosemary Anderson North mm -hmm. and next year DART. So it's really a, a model of kind of, you know, starting small and expanding and replicating. And we hope to continue replicating with another phase of the grant, which I think Nettie is going to talk about. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yes, thanks. And what's yeah. the what what's the time frame of the grant? It's a it's five year grant and we're in year four. And it's called an initial, we're in the what's called an it, this is called an initial phase grant. And so there is a mid phase and there's there are many opportunities that we are very much wanting to take advantage of. Um, okay, so this is just a little bit more about the theory of action. Um, you know, really taking some of those authentic and um, hands on uh, project experiences for students, weaving them with um, social emotional learning, really um, paying attention to culturally sustaining practice and really weaving in CTE. Um, our theory of action is if we do that well, then PrEP will become the driver of opportunity to improve collaboration and coherence among multiple pathway schools and programs. And we have so many um, great examples of projects that have done that integration of all three um, legs of that stool that um, if some of the other people tonight don't share some of those examples, I will jump back in and do so because they are great, but I don't wanna steal anybody's thunder. So um, just you know, to conclude my part, we just um, really believe that this approach is positively impacting um, the ability of students to engage in their education. It's shown through their attendance their persistence, completion, achievement. And we believe that we are graduating students at higher rates ready for college and career. And I think that the next person on is Nettie. Thank you, Lorna. And I realize I didn't ask before, um, do I have the power to move the slides or will someone move them for me? I'll, I'll move them for you, Nettie. Great, thanks, Lorna. Okay, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity. Um, so as Lorna described, student engagement is really the big idea uh, behind PrEP. And what's innovative about PrEP is not, you know, any of these individual components. Um, CTE has been around for decades, uh, project-based learning, 
almost as long. SEL is uh, social emotional learning is kind of the new kid on the block, uh, more or less, but thank goodness we're uh, paying attention to that. But what's innovative about this, and I think what enabled us to be awarded the early phase grant um, what is the holistic integration of these strategies uh, with, with really um, an understanding that everyone in the building owns all of these and uh, that, that it's our job to weave them together to, to uh, keep students in the center and student engagement as our goal. Um, Lorna already spoke to a little bit bit, uh, the schools that were uh, involved in the pilot and uh, bringing on Rosemary Anderson Lentz this year. Uh, and we um, are serving over a thousand students. We've served over a thousand students uh, through the initial pilot phase. And go ahead and go to the next slide. So we're really exceeding um, our targets for serving students. Uh, and we're also on track, as Lorna mentioned, uh, with our replication goals. Um, one thing I wanted to add uh, is that in addition to kind of replicating outside, and we may have, if we are awarded a mid-phase grant, an opportunity to, you know, uh, reach beyond uh, uh, PPS and create a little bit of a network um, of alternative programs that are working these same strategies uh, throughout Multnomah County. So that's something I wanted to, to raise. Um, but the other point I wanted to make is that PrEP uh, has been, its profile has been getting uh, higher in the district. And um, we've really been advancing some system shifts within PPS that are called for within our vision. Uh, the PrEP framework for project-based learning is the basis for a district-wide framework that was drafted last year by a PBL work group that I served on um, and continues to be iterated. Uh, PrEP uh, is at the table with the culturally sustaining work group, the Career Pathways pilot that's funded through the CTE Innovation Grant, uh, and also middle school redesign. Um, so I, it's been really exciting to be kind of in MPG at this time and leading this vanguard for innovation within PPS. Go ahead to the next slide. So I wanted to uh, briefly update you just on progress on each of the components of PrEP. Um, for CTE, we've established three new programs of study uh, in two schools that had no T CTE programs before PrEP. Uh, so now we have an education and communications programs of study at uh, Metropolitan Learning Center and a design and applied arts program at Alliance at Benson. And for those of you who are listening who might not be sure what a program of study is, um, it's an opportunity, a pathway for students to earn certification in a high wage, high growth industry. Some students can earn college credit and it really lays a strong foundation for the next step. Uh, as Lorna pointed out, uh, in terms of graduating from high school and uh, going on to college, uh, an apprenticeship, or directly into the workforce. And it is not a trivial undertaking for schools to uh, stand up a uh, program of study. Teachers have to be certified in CTE. There's course development that has to happen. Um, there's equipment, state approval. It's, it's a process. And we've had a lot of support from the CTE department in uh, PPS. And um, yeah, just to stand up three programs in over just a couple of years is, is a remarkable achievement. Uh, and perhaps also been increasing capacity to provide a range of uh, career connected learning experiences. One of the things in the early phase uh, grant we have is the luxury of kind of learning. And what we're learning is that uh, CTE programs of study, formal programs of study for all kids is probably not going to happen. Um, so we're really paying a lot of attention to uh, bolstering the uh, wider range of career connected learning opportunities that are available. Go ahead to the next slide. 
So social emotional learning, the biggest investment of the PrEP grant is social emotional learning. The grant provides for a full-time social worker in each of the sites. Uh, that social worker helps create and lead a SEL team that's tasked with establishing a really a comprehensive approach to SEL that includes school-wide culture and practice and uh, targeted and intensive supports and interventions. And I really can't overstate the importance of having trained staff whose job it is to do this work um, in the buildings. We know that from research and experience that a close relationship with just one caring adult and ideally a network of adults, but even just one adult can make a huge difference in whether a young person stays engaged in school. Um, but we also know that adults in schools are typically neither trained, equipped, nor resourced to tend to the mental, social, emotional wellness of students, of each other, uh, and even of themselves. Um, and if there is anything that the last year has, uh, has shown us is that um, this caring community is absolutely essential to being able to really get through hard times. Um, and we've gotten some great support on all of these fronts uh, this spring from Dr. Dina Simmons. Uh, Dr. Simmons is a leading voice in equity and social emotional learning. Uh, she's the founder of Liberate Ed, a national collective focused on the intersection of SEL and racial justice and healing. Uh, and you can learn more about her. Uh, we've spotlighted her work on the PrEP website uh, and I'll share the link to that with you at the end of this presentation. Next slide. So the third leg of PrEP is project-based learning. And this is really where we see the students and the teachers coming alive over the last few years. Uh, and I want you to imagine project-based learning as the, the leg of this three-legged stool that is painted bright spring green, um, kind of like the color of the shirt I have on today. It's just really a, a vibrant practice that has taken root and is growing. Um, you might have learned about some of the projects from PrEP's first pilot year, uh, which was 2018-19. One of the highest profile ones was the Field Guide to Fungi of Opal Creek. Um, the link uh, on the slide here will take you to a nice article that unpacks the magic of this project. We also have the magician on this call, one of them, uh, Joe Ferguson, who's on the line. And uh, we also did a number of other projects that year. And mind you, that was the very first pilot year. So um, it, it was really uh, quite remarkable. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, so the second year, the second pilot year, we also had a number of projects underway uh, when the pandemic sent everybody home. But teachers and students and community partners um, didn't stop. They actually adapted to keep a number of these projects going remotely. And I'm really pleased to share that I'm gonna be moderating a panel later this month at the National Youth Employment Commission's All Youth Connecting Forum um, to talk about this experience of being applied and virtual at the same time and how uh, we were able to adapt to the virtual environment. Uh, and the panel is gonna include our student, Kayla Ford, um, who we hope will be able to join us if she hasn't already, uh, and Joe Ferguson. And then also to community partners. This is another thing that we've seen really growing is teachers uh, reaching out to community partners and bringing them in to support student learning. Uh, we have Jackie Santa Lucia, who's going to be joining us on the panel from Your Street, Your Voice, um, and Peter Krim from the Wind and Or Boat School. Uh, I Has Kayla had a chance to join us? I wanted to see if she... She is not. She is not. Joe is. Okay. okay, well, Joe, you are here. Um, and I could, I know one anecdote uh, that Kayla has shared, but why don't I turn this over to you and just ask you, you know, what was this like to uh, adapt these projects to um, the virtual environment? And just in general, what has project based learning uh, uh, done to teaching and learning at Meek and student engagement? Thanks. Betty, Karina, and Lorna for inviting me. Um, 
I was hoping Kayla could join us too. We were in hybrid together and I'm like, do you want to do this panel at 4.30? And she's like, I think I can make it. So hopefully she'll pop on. Um, uh, sorry if this is choppy. I'm out at, I'm getting set up for a soccer practice. I got a couple of middle school rec soccer teams I'm getting set up for practice. But um, yeah, project-based learning has been a game changer. I mean, the level of student engagement, seeing that we are doing real world projects with community partners, um, building sailboats for clients, uh, writing field guides at the professional level for nonprofits like Opal Creek Ancient Forest Center. It's just, it really brings the learning to life for these kids. The program has just been so incredible at allowing teachers to really bring these opportunities to kids and work with the um, community partners at this deep level. Um, and yeah, transitioning to online was tough, um, but you know, one thing that we did with Wind and Oar, those guys are just incredible, is we're able to develop some scale model boat kits that kids could actually build um, at home. Um, and then that worked out pretty well, you know, it's not the same thing as building a 14 foot yacht, but um, you know, still pretty cool. Um, and then this year, what I was able to do, cause uh, you know, I know they mentioned the CTE, component too. I had the natural resources CTE program at Alliance at Neek. Um, and I was able to purchase some trail cams and work with the folks at the uh, Columbia Slough Watershed Council to do a really neat like wildlife study. Um, and then also bring in some language arts components into that working with my colleague Alex Reynolds to develop a really cool um, like kind of nature and storytelling um, course. Um, the one we're teaching right now is called Migration Stories and we're learning about um, bird migration and movement, human migration and movement. Um, kids are doing some really fantastic projects and we're able to help out a really cool um, uh, local group, the, like I said, the Columbia Sioux Watershed Council. So, you know, it hasn't stopped us. It's, it's, it's made us pivot a little bit, but I think that's what's neat about the prep plan is it gets us to think creatively about ways to engage kids at these really neat deeper levels. And it's just been really fun. Yeah, thanks so much, Joe. I really, Appreciate your leadership in this too. Joe has just been such a spark plug uh, and a leader, and it's 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 been infectious. Um, literally, I have another slide of all the projects that teachers have initiated this year, uh, continuing under comprehensive distance learning. And um, I didn't include it because I, it would make us go over time for this section to be able to talk about all of those. I will say that uh, Lorna and I. Uh, today joined a uh, student's final presentation in uh, a class called Matthew Facturing um, that uh, was launched this, this spring. And for this class, uh, a math and CTE construction teacher, teachers, uh, so Miguel Mejia and Jerry Eaton partnered with Your Street, Your Voice, um, which for those of you who hadn't heard about it is a program that engages youth in learning how to use architecture and design uh, as tools, not just to build stuff, but uh, as tools to promote racial justice. And uh, the student project was to design tiny houses um, to help address Portland's affordable housing issue. And it was just fascinating to learn how they applied, uh, learned about and applied trauma-informed and equity frameworks to their designs, understood how values are embedded in design. And um, also, uh, through, you know, the, through the budgeting process and also the, the measuring and everything that they applied math to a real world problem that they really care about. And it was just delightful to see a student at the end. Um, I think this is right, Lorna, you wrote in the chat, this project made math fun. <laughs> and the math teacher wrote back and said, math should, that's the way math should always be. <laughs> so it was just a, a fun experience to be able to sit in on that. Um, Thanks again, Joe. If we can go ahead to the next slide. Hey, I have no a quick question, and maybe this is for you, Joe, but um, just hearing about all this fabulous project-based learning, I'm wondering if um, we've, any of you involved with the PrEP grant have, have been part of the um, design and planning for the MPG building and for getting uh, input? Yeah. That's a great question. You set us up. That was a good one. Uh, yeah. So um, we were able to work with uh, the folks at, at ELSO and Your Street, Your Voice. And we actually designed a class where kids 
we're working directly with the architects and engineers of the MPG building to have their specific cultural identities reflected in the building of that new building. It was incredible. And then uh, again, the final presentations were like off the hook. The kids were super excited. I mean, Kayla could talk about it too. If she was here, I don't know if she's made it on yet, but, um, but yeah, it was, it was really cool. And one of those projects where you're like, yeah, we want, you know, you, you can see yourself in this building, you know, they won't actually be able to go there because they'll be graduated by then. But the, the kids that come after them will, 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 they'll be honored by that, uh, their, their input into the design process. Well, and then also, as I'm sure you know, during the construction process, part of our contract is that the prime contractor uh, creates uh, student experiences and, you know, ways to integrate um, some of the construction and construction management issues into the curriculum. So, you know, you guys, you guys make sure your voices are heard and what you really want that to look like. Cause there's a fair degree of flexibility there. So make sure you remain, you know, connected to your, your contractor and figure out what those student experiences should look like. That, that is great. Um, so I think that next we have, we have just a little bit of data that we want to share with you and then, and then open it up for, for questions and answers. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Karina. Um, thanks for that question. Uh, it is really fun to hear from the students who were like working on designing their schools and like green roofs and the whole, the whole thing. Um, uh, yeah. So with innovation projects, there's always a risk, right. Um, that we could make things worse because we've never done this before. And, uh, fortunately that does not appear to be the case in this, uh, case of implementing prep. Uh, graduation outcomes for prep um, are really our North Star and the most immediate, you know, evidence of, of not the most immediate, but what shows up uh, in the dashboard of, um, of success. And uh, we're seeing good news in these upward trends uh, at Alliance High School. The different lines that you're seeing here have to do with students who are representing the four-year cohort graduation rate in the green line. And then we have the rate for uh, CTE participants in the yellow line and the concentrators with the ones who are really completing a, in a, and completing a program of study. Uh, so it's exciting to see that um, increasing. And this is at Alliance High School. We can go to the next slide. Could I just um, <clears throat> make one little addition to this um, part of the presentation? So we have seen that the students who are coming to schools like Alliance in MPG um, have not changed. We're still having students who are entering um, sophomore, junior, sometimes senior year behind in credits, sometimes a year or more behind. And so for that reason, we've always had a lower four-year cohort graduation rate but really during our prep years, and then, you know, thanks to Measure 98 and SIA and other um, supports, we've seen that we've really been able to push that about 37 points. So it's exciting. Same kids doing much better graduating within four and then even five years. Our that's just, yeah. Can we just pause for a second there? And that's amazing. Yeah, really it is. Amazing. A, it is amazing, and and as is the next slide. Yeah, so here uh, we're seeing a reversal of a downward trend, um, and uh, may, Karina have may have more comments on this, but uh, it's nice to see that you know coming up. There's, go ahead, Karina. I was just going to say, so this this mirrors exactly. And, and there's many factors, right? Um, uh, but this, this mirrors when we added CTE to MLC. So one of the things that we did, and then and there's two things that are really important for people to know with regard to context. So with regard to context, in 1516, we very intentionally, as a district and within multiple pathways to graduation, made a greater connection between reconnection services and, and Metropolitan Learning Center. So the students that we, that, um, and looked at how are we, like we do at Alliance, how are we welcoming students mid-year at MLC? How are we, 
how are we adding more alternative elements to multiple to a metropolitan learning center as a as an alternative school? And so um, so as as um, they had their student body um, has um, somewhat changed, somewhat stayed the same, and somewhat um, broadened, which is which is great and wonderful. Um, and adding CTE, we've really seen those that trajectory. Um, just, just really go up the, the last couple of years. And we will continue to see, we anticipate continuing to see that um, bo at both campuses um, again this year. So I just wanna say that the, the, for the schools for which we have data, it, um, it is, as Nettie said, it's really, um, it's really it, um, wonderful that the data is showing this. And to Lorna's point, I just wanna make two points. We're seeing two things happen. We're seeing more students graduate and more students graduate in four years. And both of those, those are different data points and both of those are really important because we know that kids in alt ed, they're not all gonna be CTE completers because by the time they come to a sp any specific school in multiple pathways, they may not necessarily be there two full years to take two full years of CTE or a two full years of a CTE track. So we're really, um, mindful of how important CTE is, and we know our community of learners that that we don't anticipate seeing as high level of CTE completers per se, as we do in, in some of the other schools. And the other thing is just the numbers, the more kids graduating, um, we all know that whether that happens in four years or five years or six years, when we our goal is high school completion and a transition to post-secondary or ready for career. And so it's while, while, the, while the slide focused on four years and four years is important, we know in alt ed it's, it's one of many data points that are important and our job is really how do we give kids the skills um, to launch them into adulthood. So prep is just so, illuminates that so well in so many ways. Great, so, thanks Karina. Uh, so Nettie, I just wanna say your, your previous comment about your in, involvement in moving the whole district uh, really makes sense because I think you're ahead of the rest of the district and a lot of things that we've been talking about for a lot of years around engagement, project-based learning, SEL, uh, CTE, um, and you're the ones who are like actually doing it coherently. Um, so this, this all makes sense. How about for, that? Thanks, Director Bailey, for uh, reflecting that back. Um, I, I think we do feel like we're, uh, you know, alternative schools for a long, long time have been viewed as, you know, the schools of last resort and for those kids. And I think what we are um, able to do through this project is to uh, lead the way and really kind of show what it takes to really um, uh, succeed with every kid. And, um, you know, I, my own kid dropped out of high school. Uh, this is the uh, greatest irony of my life, 30 years in secondary school improvement. <laughs> and, uh, and, but, you know, she was not a fit, good fit for big box high school. And thank goodness that there was an uh, alternative program that was able to support her to graduation and beyond. Um, so, yeah, I agree. And I think this is very exciting. And I think it's very exciting that the district has a vision in place that um, actually calls for most of these uh, strategies to be to be bolstered and centered and yeah, grown. Thank you. Um, well, let's uh, bring this down the home stretch. I know there's more on the agenda. Uh, just in some prep is this holistic uh, integration that we've talked about and, and that Director Bailey just sort of described uh, very well. And, um, but it's also a community, uh, a, a learning community. We've learned together across sites through a number of um, professional development and uh, PLC routines and opportunities. And, uh, and then within each building, um, really focus on building community uh, around uh, you know, what's equitable, what's just, uh, and really by design centers students of color and historically underserved students and their families. 
Um, and then finally, you know, PrEP is part of this broader movement that we were just talking about to remove barriers, engage young people, and enlivening learning experiences. Um, and it's aligned with the PPS vision and longstanding national and global work in secondary redesign. So it just feels like uh, it resonates and we're on the right path. Um, I think, oh yeah, I wanted to, with a caveat that these are both works in progress, um, invite you all to visit the PrEP website uh, and the community Google site, uh, which is just for the PPS educators um, to learn more about this, uh, this exciting project. And it's uh, pps.net backslash prep. So can you guys give us a sense of the, um, the next steps in terms of the um, application process for the next round of PrEP grant? I can't imagine that they wouldn't want us to continue with this fabulous and highly effective work. How does that happen? So yeah, we're, we're working with uh, Talon Spitz right now to um, get executive level approval to apply for the mid phase. We're applying a year early. Uh, we, we have a fifth year of the current grant um, to go. So, but I think that uh, programmatically we're ready to do that. Uh, what may get in the way are um, some of the uh, evidence standards that we need to meet through uh, our independent evaluation. And that the EIR program um, not only provides funding for, but also requires that we contract with an independent evaluator to uh, execute a quasi-experimental study um, that will meet the What Works Clearinghouse standards uh, of evidence. And um, you know, we didn't administer MAP last year and we didn't administer it this year and uh, attendance is interesting. And so, uh, but everybody else is in the same boat. And the other way we can meet the evidence standard is through extant research. Um, and we do think that there's quite a good bit of research on CTE and uh, PBL and emerging and SEL. So anyway, we're gonna go for it. Um, if we you know, get the approval from the, the district. And, uh, and I think that uh, as a, you know, in terms of support, uh, one thing that I would love is, is just you know, the willingness of Portland Public Schools as the largest school system in the state and the you know, leader in the region to uh, around alternative education to um, kind of be open to this project, uh, embracing schools across Multnomah County and in Clackamas County initially, um, potentially more, you know, so long as the, the grant and the project sort of remain within Portland Public Schools. Uh, so it's kind of support for uh, building a network. Scott, I'm guessing that it's safe to say that um, they can uh, count, they can consider that they have the support of our board, Charter and Alternative Program Committee for taking the prep prep grant process to the next, next phase. Absolutely. Um, and it's been great to see this uh, early, early in the presentation that, that kind of dime dropped in my memory of visiting Alliance when I first got on the board and seeing the orientation, learning about the orientation, which I think was uh, for new students, that was part of prep. And so now it's like, oh yeah, I know a bit about this, but now to see it really built out a couple of years later is, is really amazing. It's just awesome work by your staff. Yeah, I think, uh... Dr. Lorna Fast Buffalo's horse's leadership um, at Alliance at the time was uh, essential. And um, you think she had something to do with it? Maybe at least a little bit. <laughs> okay. Well, um, Amy, let's uh, let's get our newbies, uh, incoming board members, on a visit if we can, uh, or will that have to wait till the fall? Um, they they should immediately pick up what's going on at Alliance. Absolutely. Anyway, we'll we'll figure that out offline. 
And I, I just want to add that I think one of the things that's really, this has really been really exciting. And like we've said on the slides, and uh, I think multiple people have said is, um, is that our, the way we would design when we wrote the grant was to include DART schools. It was to include our CBO, our community alternative schools, our CBO schools. And so we're really able to really kind of hone our practice the first couple of years and really work on those things. And now it's, it's a really exciting time also to taking it to different communities of learners. So, um, so it feels, uh, that part feels really good as we're getting more and more schools and more and more students then impacted and more and more teachers excited about, about their practice. So, um, and a lot of, a lot of good leadership. Um, so Bonnie Hobson, the current pre principal of Alliance is not here. And Mark Van Humason, the current principal of MLC is not here. And they both um, have been working really hard as well. Thank you so much, um, prep team. It's great to, to touch back in with that and keep in touch. And uh, Karina, I wanna move us along so that we have just a yeah. few minutes to go through the um, evaluation process for our contracted alternative schools, um, just so we can check in and see where we are with that, if there have been any changes to that and um, uh, clue us in on the timeline as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I just want to, he might have already jumped off, but I just want to thank Joe Ferguson for jumping in as a teacher also. Um, and thank you to Nettie for all her leadership in leading this work. Um, it's, it's much appreciated and, and very, um, very visible. Um, so now we're switching, switching gears. And um, so some of the questions that, that we have received, um, we wanted to respond to, which is how do we evaluate our contracted alternative schools? Um, and what's the process for our annual evaluation of contracted alternative schools? And so um, at this point, I'll turn it over to Erica Stavis. Thanks, Karina. It's kind of hard to follow up on that last presentation. I have to say it was so um, well-rounded and as you know, being a participant in the prep leadership team, it's kind of nice to like hear that summary report when you're like more in the weeds. I'm like, wow, this is really great. You kind of forget sometimes um, all the impact it has. So thanks. For that. Um, no, I wanted to touch briefly on our evaluation and contract cycle for our CBO schools. As you are aware, this year we finished, um, completed an RFP process, which occurs every five years for our contracted alternative schools. Um, all of the programs that um, we have an intent to award to, all the programs that we're currently contracting with had um, received an intent to award. And so we're currently in the process of negotiating contracts for the next five years um, and they're a five-year contract with annual renewals. So it's just kind of important to understand that context. And um, here, you know, we just outlined our kind of board obligation in terms of what we're required to do um, as a district as we do work with these contracted alternative school partners. Um, and so we have to maintain learning situations that are flexible with regard to environment, time, structure, and pedagogy. And we have to establish standards for private education programs to make sure that it's safe. Um, it's a well-rounded instructional program and provides students with the opportunity to make progress towards graduation. And so next few slides, please go forward. Kind of talk very briefly, an overview of kind of the processes that we have in place. So our evaluation cycle um, includes a variety of different um, elements and I'm sorry, bear with me. Somebody is ringing my doorbell. I'm going to ignore that. Um, it includes a variety of different components that um, include everything from academic and program and, and student progress to compliance with district. Okay, hold on one second. So I can I can pick sorry, that up. I have a solicitor, but I told my daughter to tell him to leave, please. It also includes um, making sure that all of our organizations that we contract with meet all the compliance and district and uh, state statutes. And as you're aware, there's specific. Yeah, he's here. He's going to come back. Thank you. Um, it also um, there's specific statutes that relate to private alternative schooling in the state, and so we follow all of that guidance. And then, of course, fiscal and management overview. 
Um, this is kind of a broad graphic that we have that describes the various components of our alternative accountability framework. And as you can see, it includes some performance goals and standards, as well as um, goal setting. We have a formal site review process that takes place every year. Um, and we provide reports um, to those schools after visiting. And of course, this is standalone site reviews, but we're doing ongoing investigation of schools throughout the year, visiting schools, talking with leaders. We have, um, because of COVID this year, it's been, this aspect of COVID has been a blessing in that we've been able to meet much more regularly as a CBO network of leaders. Uh, so we meet twice a month to talk about a variety of different things. We also have a set of annual deliverables that we collect beginning of year and end of year. And so these are some of our more compliance driven measures that we have in place to ensure that everything from the fact that they have a defibrillator on site to um, things like they're um, auditing their synergy to make sure that period attendance is accurate. And so it's a mix of different things, a number of instructional hours, a whole um, bevy of different things. And then of course we work with them on um, school improvement planning and other aspects of their goal setting um, that aligns with you know, their own goals and also matches our district's goals. And so this just kind of um, is an overview of how this framework works. Um, you know, that calendar is meant to be kind of a standing point for new leaders we have and new contractors to kind of understand the overarching accountability that we have for our contracted schools. And then, of course, um, like we mentioned, different checkpoints for different schools where there might be issues that we are feeling we need to dig deeper into. Currently, we're in our spring phase. This year, we have been a little bit delayed due to, um, you know, COVID. But we have completed almost all of our site reviews at this point. We have one more school in which we're doing um, a more in-depth um, site review with, not because of any reason, just because of scheduling snafus and um, currently putting together the reports. Um, we have an alternative accountability, um, sorry, can you go back one slide? Thank you. Um, so we have a um, alternative accountability report card, which is something that our own SPP department puts together um, after validating with our contracted partners. And this includes a variety of different metrics, which we measure each year in terms of student performance, school culture and climate. Each school gets one and then we have one for the broader CBO network. And, um, you know, they, you, we use information in Synergy and then also the Panorama Survey and a variety of different things. So it includes demographics as well as outcomes. And currently we're obviously in contract negotiations. We will have some documents actually coming your way this month at the end of the month for our um, contracted alternative school contracts. And I think we have you on the docket for the June 29th um, board approval. So we're in the process of getting those all ready by the timeline in order to submit for your approval. So um, Eric and Karina, when we have those <clears throat> contract renewals that come to the board um, with organizations that have already been serving our students, can we make sure that we get past um, accountability report cards included as background when the, that information comes to the board? Absolutely. We are happy to do that. And, and I just, I'm going to repeat what Erica and I think Nettie just, just said earlier, which is um, it, Given the pandemic, um, we weren't able to complete maps. We were able to pre-test, but not post-test last year. And then we weren't able to do that this year. So we will certainly give you past years and what we have um, with an asterisk around um, adjustments we've had to make for the pandemic. Same, same as we had for our charter schools. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yes. And Amy, we also put a little caveat on the report card itself, just saying some of the data might be impacted by, you know, school site closures. This way it's per there permanently on the report card as well. It's hard to think that anybody will forget, you know, this year, but in 20 years from now, when there's all new people, it'll be good to have it on there too. All right, next slide. So we do actually on the report cards have a few different data points. The report cards do point to a plethora of different details, but we just highlighted a few things. So we have, um, this is for 1920. So the previous year, we usually um, start doing the report cards around December or January of the following year, because we need the year to close and all kinds of other state reporting to be completed before we kind of have the data for our schools. So it's more of a look back at the previous year, similar to a state report card. So for 1920, we have um, the racial breakdown of the CBO population, keeping in mind that this does not include Helen's View School um, because they're not in our instance of synergy. So it's a little bit more cumbersome to put their data reports together. 
Um, however, this is a breakdown. And of course, this is our overall CBO population. And I believe in 1920, there were about um, 17, I think 16 to 1700 students served um, throughout the school year across our CBO network. And so, you know, any one of our schools might look very different in terms of um, a racial breakdown, but this is across our entire network. And then um, once again, with students with identified disabilities, we have 23% um, who have an IEP. Keep in mind that that range, this is our overall population, but our range, some of our schools have anywhere as low as 15% and some have as high as 45% of their individual school, you know, student um, population that received special education services. Hey, Can Erica, the yeah. first slice of the pie on the left. Yes. Is, is that indigenous students? It's not labeled. There's like 38 students, thus the dark blue. Ooh, yes. Um, yes. Yeah. yes. Sorry about that. Thank you for that clarification. And I can update the slideshow to make sure that chart is updated. All right, next slide. This, this is my work life. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't, I mean, I could go all day when it comes to graphics. Ask anybody on my team. Um, I is the more fun part of my job. I actually have a computer art background. So when I get to utilize any of my infographic skills, I get very excited. Um, here is also when I talked about, we have a, a summary report for 1920. Here are some of the numbers for that year, which I think are really promising and exciting, keeping in mind, once again, the population of students served by our CBO schools. So you know, each of these is defined more specifically on the report card with more detailed metrics, but the one year grad rate, um, so students who are eligible for graduation who graduate within that year, 89% of students who are eligible to graduate in that year graduated. Average daily attendance, so these are students who had 85% um, um, average daily attendance at the school was 79% growth in daily attendance, which we felt was, of course, a very important metrics because many of these students um, have been disengaged previously, 72% of them have shown an increase in attendance. Now, that could be a student who went from 10% to 20%. It could be a student who went from 80% to 90%. But that growth metrics is really important to look at. So this is the percentage of students who showed a growth in attendance, which is effectively one of the reasons why one of the many reasons in why we contract with these alternative programs to provide a more engaging setting so that um, students do engage more. And then in terms of annual retention, 83% of the students who were enrolled at one point in the year were um, you know, kept with the district, maybe not in that specific school setting, but were retained within the district. So 83% of the students uh, were retained which is once again, one of the biggest strategies um, that our contracted alternative schools help us with. Do you guys know how that average daily attendance figure uh, compares to our district overall figure? It's we different, could. well, yeah, we can find out. And so there's been, you know, there's been discussion, um, we've been actually in conversations about revising the report card a little bit because it really was designed, um, you know, about five, uh, many years ago and involved a variety of different stakeholders. And we're actually working now with the new um, dashboard that's being created to try and develop more live reports for some of these metrics, as opposed to just being a standalone from the previous year, being able to measure some of these things throughout the year. And so one of the things that we've been discussing is like, what is the right metric to use for alternative schools and how is it, we do want to compare to our comprehensive schools, of course, but also realizing we serve a completely different population of students. And so how can we tailor the report card to give us that information for both of those things? Karina? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just mindful of time. And yes. so I know that, um, that I know that we, I, we wanted to um, stop and let, um, let board members have a moment to transition to, to their next meeting. But I do want to say we're happy to take any questions and we're happy to take any questions right now. We're happy to take any questions via email or in the future too. So don't, this is an important conversation and I don't mean to cut it short, but I'm mindful of, but I'm just acknowledging mm -hmm. the time. No, I really appreciate this because, um, you know, we, of course, the contracts come to the board for approval, um, but we didn't have, I didn't have a lot of clarity about the evaluation process. So I think moving forward, we'll, we'll make sure that those are a little bit better connected because we do have great data to show. Um, and it's important for the board to see that. 
Great. And then next slide, please. And then the, the last topic um, is there were some questions. Thank you so much, Erica. I just want to say thank you uh, for all the work. Um, the, our last topic is um, just uh, multiple pathways cohort wide support. So there were some questions around what are the supports that multiple pathways receives as a cohort or what are the supports school wide that our schools receive. And so I just jotted down um, um, a, a few of them. This is not probably a complete list, but just some of the things that that in answer to some of the questions that we received. So credit recovery supports this summer, we're using ESSER dollars um, and offering services both in the in the CBOs as well as in our summer scholars. Um, so a lot of credit recovery supports. We have student success and mental health supports. So um, Amy, uh, we work uh, we work very closely with Amy Rona and James Loveland. And when they talk about providing mental health supports or culturally culturally congruent mental health supports to different schools, um, our our multiple pathway schools are included in that in that, and they're. As that continues to grow, I, those conversations are continuing to grow. So that's a piece um, that we're excited about, um, as well as, um, again, I just said summer scholars, and then college coordination. So in our in our Measure 98, um, in our Measure 98 funding, one of the things that has been identified is looking at two things: is the credit recovery support. So having somebody in multiple path a position and um, look at how are we working with contracted alternative schools and multiple pathways around credit recovery and what are the specific needs in our schools, as well as another, um, another resource around college coordination. And so uh, an, another position that'll be um, with Erica, but serving multiple pathways wide is really looking at that college to, and career co coordination. And so really wanting, so, so every school, some of our schools, as you know, are very small. And so not wanting every school to feel like they have to do all that lift on their own, um, but trying to get some coordination as a system. So that's a little bit, and I don't know if there's other questions. I think it would be a good idea for us to revisit this and to really take a look at the Measure 98 and the SIA dollars. We talked about it a little bit and I got some information from our budget office about, um, you know, my question was around whether there's equitable distribution um, of those kind of school-wide supports. But um, I think we'll put this on hold for now, but it would it would be good to uh, revisit it and, and also have some questions about other areas like um, athletic support and, uh, you know, all, all aspects of counseling services, not just um, college counseling. Uh, Great. Um, and also, uh, I know Alliance used to have an issue around Title I. Did that get cleaned up? So that is going to get cleaned up when we get to the multiple pathways building, because the challenge has been, which Director Bailey knows, when having us on two campuses, the, the physical address um, for our alliance at Benson students is for Benson Polytechnic, is the same address as Benson Polytechnic High School. And so um, th that did not get cleaned up because of the way ODE does their definitions. However, when we build a multiple pathways building, um, that will get cleaned up because we will have our own address. Um, and we were, are also moving to Kenton, to the Kenton building next year. So the hope is in, that next year we can relook at that as well. I tell you, we Thanks. invent more ways to get in the way of kids getting what they need than, yeah. okay, we should run. Yeah, we do need to go um, a quick, you wanna say a quick Thank you. congrats. Thank you so much. Hang, before you go, hang on Director Bailey, just a sec. I just want to say we have kids and I just being clear that we're a K-12 cohort, that we have a lot of um, fabulous fifth graders and amazing eighth graders and wonderful high school graduates and GED completers going on to post-secondary. That's it. Thank you, guys. That's Thanks, fantastic. everybody. I want to say, please, um, everybody, give me just a moment to thank Director Bailey for serving with us on this committee. This will be our last meeting of the Charter and Alternative Schools Committee. And Scott, I just really appreciate how much of a heart you have for <clears throat> these students and these programs. And you always love doing the school visits. And I personally just really appreciate your insights and your deep commitment to these kids. Thank you. That's that's 
It means a lot. We're going to miss you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Go Blazers. Thanks, all.